our second panel, um, again, in no intentional way, um, is, is focused more on, as we call them, technologists, for lack of a better term, but moreover to try to build this narrative uh, arc and think about how wonderfully, actually, the talks we just heard actually set up many technical questions that I myself, as a pigeonholed engineer, often um, am surprised at how much I learned about technical aspects of thinking about concrete construction, even it's very material science in terms of uh, ecology and life, um, uh, thinking about how concrete itself is, you know, a dynamic thing was one of the main components of the last conference. And I think we're going to continue that um, in this panel, particularly um, thinking about concrete and energy. There was one question in the Q&A that we didn't really fit into the last one, but I think sets us up maybe in this one in that one thing to realize about concrete um, that we didn't touch on at all in the last conference um, is that it is directly acting as a thermodynamic medium in our built environment as well. And that relationship is one of both its making. So that relates to what we just referred to in, in, the, in the forests not being burned to fire the kilns for concrete which in a strange way now we're rethinking because we're now firing our kilns with fossil fuels. And so is there a way that we should be returning to biomass or does that make sense? And those kinds of questions on the larger scale, um, as I referred to earlier, life cycles of materials or whether that is really the right framework to be bringing in to rethink um, concrete's use and whether or not there's just a different thing that we should be thinking about in terms of after concrete. Um, and again, thinking broadly about all those interrelationships that concrete has in the built environment, both the fact that as you pour it, it heats up. And one point of reference to that question, particularly about how heat is a byproduct of curing concrete, um, is that Brandon Clifford, who spoke at the last conference, actually has a project cooking with concrete, where he pours food inside concrete to cook it using that heat. So there are all kinds of polemics out there with concrete and heat. The one that's more common in my world and maybe in some of my collaborators um, and some of our participants in this panel is also how it relates to the energy infrastructure of buildings and heating and how it is a massive substance um, and what might be other massive substances that we can use uh, to think about concrete and energy more broadly. So uh, we have a great slate of speakers. Um, uh, Kiel Mo first from McGill University, uh, architect and amazing author and thinker and good friend. And then followed, following him, um, Lola Benalon from Columbia, uh, will bring us some context on alternative materials we can think about uh, from concrete, followed by David Benjamin, also from Columbia, um, who I've worked with mostly on wood actually here uh, at Princeton on a building that he designed here. And he'll bring in some ideas around embodied energy and how architects can design with these concepts. Felix Heisel from Cornell, thinking of the circular economy and materials and how those come together. And then finally, Dan Steingart, as uh, Lucia mentioned earlier today, um, colleague in engineering at Columbia, who is an expert and renowned scientist in energy housed in a department that origin, originates itself in materials. So that will be a fun place to land. So up first we have Kio, welcome friend. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to kick off the debate around materials and their life cycles and concrete. Wonderful. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Forrest and Lucia. It's, it's great as always. This is a great conversation. Um, happy to be a part of it. Um, so today I'm gonna to speak about the uh, fallacy of misplaced concreteness, which is according to Whitehead, Albert North Whitehead. Um, sorry get this out of the way. Uh, the fallacy is the error, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness is the error of mistaking the abstract for the concrete. One of his students summarized the fallacy of misplaced concreteness by observing that it misleads us into thinking that we have all of reality when we have instead only part of it. And consequently, we inquire and live with inadequate abstractions and insufficient concreteness. That is, um, an entity that seems concrete or otherwise well-defined like a molecule or a building is actually uh, often an abstraction and incomplete description. 
At the core of our misplaced concreteness in architecture is an even more basic ontological problem that Whitehead identifies as the problem of simple loca location. And to quote him, to say that a bit of matter has a simple location means that in expressing its spatial temporal relations, it is adequate to state that it is where it is in a definite finite region of space and throughout a definite finite duration of time. Apart from any essential re reference to the relations of that bit of matter to other regions of space or to other durations of time. I shall argue that among the primary elements of nature as apprehended in our immediate experience, there is no element whatsoever which possesses this character of simple location. In short, in short um, because it's so directly implicated that the, the, in building and architecture, uh, that last phase is worth restating, that there is no element which possesses this character of simple location. Consider, for instance, the chair that you are sitting in. It cannot be fully described by its present property as simply located under you. Rather, it is present location and state is only one of many unfolding states, one episode in its full spatial temporal relations on this planet. These relations would include the biogeophysical basis of the chair's source matter to its extraction, to its, the industrial and labor processes that transformed it into its present form, as well as its future states in which it'll be moved around your abode, altered, broken, and repaired, and perhaps discarded at some point disintegrating back into the environment from which it emerged. No doubt one could provide a rich and intricate description of the chair in its present state under you, but less, uh, a less abstract description of the chair will only emerge from a much more extended ex explication of all of its spatial temporal relations. If we merely describe the chair as there underneath you, then our description is characteristically limited. And what is true is something as putatively simple as a chair is most certainly the case for something as terrestrially complex and process intensive as contemporary building. Building, to be sure, is not simply located. Despite many received traditions of design and description, building spatio temporal relations cannot be situated in a definite finite region of space through a definite finite duration of time. Um, to better grasp matter like concrete, much less more complex material organizations like buildings, we need to move beyond architecture's problem of simple location that stunts its reasoning and imagination about what architecture is and does as a terrestrial entity. To understand matter is to become much more literal and concrete about the manifold states, processes, world systems that are presently absent from discussions of uh, material and building, of course, out excluding the uh, present company. Um, from a terrestrial perspective, though, the incorporeal, incorporeal character of buildings, ecology, and world systems is just as concrete as the corporeal building itself. Moreover, the incorporeal world systems of a building shape the concreteness of reality, not just of certain architectural artifacts on specific sites, maybe in Manhattan, but the other environmental and social conditions of collective life around this planet. These terrestrial systems are not external to the practice of architecture. Far flung, flung people, places, and processes cannot be abstracted from this process of building. No building is possible without them, and to occlude them from our description of building is, engraved, is a grave error. One case of the misplaced, uh, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness uh, pertinent to this symposium um, focused on the dynamics of dynamics of materials is the example of life cycle self assessment or LCA. LCA is putatively a way to assess the environmental aspects associated with the product over its quote unquote life cycle. It vainly, vainly strives to answer qu queries such as what environmental Im impact does one object have over the other? Uh, Variants of LCA, each of which suffer the vicissitudes of the human-centric metaphor of its nomenclature, include cradle to gate, cradle to grave, and cradle to cradle. In each variant, the accounting of the dynamics and cycles of the product in question begins with the cradle, or its moment of extraction by humans and then onto processing, transportation, emissions, and so forth. The arithmetic of LCA accounting begins with extraction, um, and this assignment of a prod building product's cradle as the moment of, uh, at the moment of extraction poses uh, the core problem of LCA. Through its system boundary definition, it includes the biogeophysical work of the planet and all the important terrestrial relations and processes that precede extraction. 
In this regard, in both methodological and philosophical terms, the system boundary definition of LCA treats the planet as an infinite reserve, as a stock of free sort resources awaiting human extraction. As Bill Bram and his colleagues have noted, the notion that raw material materials for building construction are plentiful and can be extracted at will from the Earth's geobiosphere is alarming and entirely inaccurate. In other words, LCA is teleological. It is a mode of description made in terms of the human processes and purposes uh, intended for those resources, rather than the terrestrial causes by which matter and energy arise on this planet. Note that behavior and tendencies of living systems, um, uh, sorry, so in this regard, uh, LCA is a uh, receiver theory of value as opposed to a donor-based theory of value, which I think is the, the important distinction uh, that we'll probably return to. Um, as a method of description, LCA does not refer to the total terrestrial life of an object or a process or a material, as its nomenclature errantly suggests, but rather only to the life uh, of that product uh, and its use value, most often in the techno-managerial context of a neoliberal economy. It certainly does not provide, despite its misnomer, a description of the life and the full spatial temporal relations of a terrestrial entity. In short, in much of the way that sustainable design is neither sustainable nor a theory of design, life cycle assessment unnecessarily limits how we reason and imagine the life, cycles, and assessment of things on this planet. Um, in this way, um, to illustrate the, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness of LCA in action, consider the dynamics of timber architecture. LCA is used pervasively in the research and design of timber buildings, especially in terms of mass timber carbon cycles. The LCA of carbon and timber building components hazards calculations re regarding how much carbon is assumed to be locked in the cellular solid structure of timber material at its moment of extraction. The LCA of carbon and timber building components, um, sorry, at this, at this moment of uh, extraction and when the timber is cut and, and removed from the forest. Um, this extraction is the timber's cradle stage and paradoxically, it reflects the moment in which the timber is cut away from a living system, a forest. Um, thus, the cradle stage uh, of timber at once marks the death of the living tree in the forest and the birth of that timber's life as a, a commodity. LCA tracks its post-mortem cycles, emissions, and uses. Based on this calculation of how the now dead timber um, is, is processed, the assumed carbon storage of a mass timber component is then extrapolated to a total amount of tar carbon stored um, in the material in the building itself. The misplaced concreteness of LCA building uh, calculations accounts um, is, is inextricably counted independent of the biogeophysical dynamics of the forest. The method abstracts quite crudely myriad living system processes uh, from its calculation. Um, so this Fallacy thus inheres within the following uh, observation, that ca the carbon commonly understood to be locked into timber does not in the ecological sense of carbon cycles come from trees. It comes from forests and the biogeophysical work of the planet. The carbon captured in timber building components is rather a displacement of, of these other forest processes. The carbon stored in timber building components is an outcome of carbon cycles and pooling in these larger systems. The ecology and carbon dynamics of the forest are as real as the timber building component itself, and moreover, not only make the timber building product possible, but is the only way for properly accounting the actual carbon dynamics of the timber building uh, component. And if the, the forest itself is a source of carbon emissions, as it is the case in Canada, then any material extracted from that source, from that forest, cannot magically and suddenly become a carbon sink in, in our urban built environments. This is all the more true when the timber building component has been extracted, transported, processed, installed, maintained, and eventually demolished through a plethora of carbon emission intensive processes. Um, in other words, um, just because you have a debit card uh, does not mean that you have any money in your account. Um, Construing the carbon stored as a, as, uh, uh, as a material property, as LCA does, is a primary example of Whitehead's problem of simple location. Uh, these, these LCA calculations simply locate the, the carbon uh, in the timber building product. Uh, 
This is an error that undermines the primary motivations and purposes of addressing the carbon cycles of building in the first place. Um, so carbon is not a material property, but rather a property of, of the dynamics of much larger systems. No carbon cycle whatsoever pro possesses the property of simple location, in other words. Um, important terrestrial living processes have been excluded um, in, the, in the name of life cycle assessment is peculiarly ironic uh, in this case of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Uh, the simple location of carbon and timber LCAs, as to quote a uh, Whitehead student, misleads us into thinking we have all of reality when instead we only have part of it. And, and, um, and accordingly, uh, these misplaced claims about carbon become concretized in our discourse, uh, you know, in, in scientific literature as well as in popular kind of boosterism for mass timber construction. So it's not merely a base scientific error that I'm discussing, but uh, it's something that quickly propagates through the discourse and through the practice and through the political ecology of timber. Um, or as Greg, uh, Gregory Bateson stated, it, there is an ecology of bad ideas just as there is an ecology of weeds and it is characteristic that, of the system that basic error propagates itself. By contrast, our ability to properly reason and imagine the carbon dynamics of mass timber hinges on our ability to expand our understanding of timber to include forests, in this case, or the actually living systems that do the consequential work of photosynthesis, along with myriad other chemical, material, energetic, hydrological, and other forms of planetary work. In this regard, the complexity of ecology, rather than the reductive techno-managerial use value accounting of LCA, better serves as a basis for our understanding of how humans interact with the thin surface of this planet. Much of the carbon sequestered by a forest is locked into elements other than trees. Forest uh, carbon is pooled below ground in soil and roots and loose litter on the ground and above ground in dead trees, to name but a few of these uh, pools and cycles. Um, in this regard, again, that any carbon that we imagine involved in buildings is just a displacement of, of these types of terrestrial processes. Above ground woody, harvested woody uh, biomass is but one and not necessarily the most important or largest pool of carbon in most forests. Uh, and to not grasp this, the dynamics of uh, this carbon pooling uh, and thus not to construe timber building as a new type of above ground carbon pool itself really limits our description of what a timber building is and what its carbon cycles might be. Um, so um, I'll, I'll wrap up by simply just making a case that we need a, a much broader system boundary. Uh, we need an ecological view of, of these dynamics as we describe um, materials such as timber or concrete to ourselves uh, in architecture. Um, and uh, just as I guess as a closer, um, I do believe deeply that our best pedagogy for this is uh, systems ecology, uh, specifically in the form of Howard T. Odom's absolutely breathtaking, not only scientific understanding of this, but the kind of political ecology that was inherent to all of his uh, scholarship. Um, so I'll leave it there and pass it on to my next colleague. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Kio, um, I'm struck by, as Lola, I think is next. Hi, Lola. Uh, as she sets up, I'm struck by the fact that we're, if we're elaborating an alternate theory of a material is not something that's just here and there. Um, so far, I'm just keeping track of the things that are the there, that elsewhere. Uh, so far, you, you pointed to the pool, the, the carbon pool, but um, earlier this morning, we also heard about the factory, the other there. So in Nimrod's case, the cement factory is often forgotten when talked about when we talk about the ubiquity of concrete, it's often forgotten that the fact that cement has to be produced somewhere offers opportunities for monopoly. And that's another place that one could point to, another, let's say, absence. And then of course the stock uh, that Atia was pointing us to uh, as a place that is also absent from something that can be controlled. In your case, you're talking about the pool, which is a different gesture, you're pointing to something larger, but um, yeah. fantastic. Um, Lola, unless somebody has any specific questions for Kiel, uh, and no, I don't see any in the chat. Oh, no, okay. So then we will move on to Lola. Uh, go right ahead. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, such a great discussion since uh, the beginning of the morning. Thank you, um, Forrest and Lucia, for 
um, having me and thank you for all the other participants. Um, in my slide deck, I would um, hope to challenge the notion of what concrete is and what technologies could be um, applied for earth and bio-based alternatives to concrete. But let's um, first um, start at the beginning, right? The evolution of conventional building materials have started with, you know, the adoption and um, improvement of materials that were mined and curated from nature nearby, right? And that has been allowing a great increase in efficiency, uh, pace, amount um, of construction. So that's a good thing. So we essentially started with curating these spaces in nature um, and specifically in natural caves like this one uh, near my hometown in Israel um, um, that were the first buildings made of thermal mass, uh, right? So the large heat capacity here uh, of the cave walls regulated uh, our space temperatures uh, with really low fluctuations that were less than one uh, uh, degree Celsius between day and night. Um, so that thermal mass absorbs the thermal energy and gives a uh, thermal energy back in a way that regulates the surrounding temperatures. And with this notion in mind, I really wanted to go back to what concrete, how concrete is defined and how it was developed as a solidified form of matter right, imitating this cave-like dwelling in a more predictable, uh, practical, and uh, even shapeable manner. So the word concrete comes from Latin in a sense of matter that grows together from the interaction between its components to form a mass resembling stone on hardening. So how do we create those artificial caves? What is the basic formula for this artificial rock? And we all hopefully uh, kind of know the answer. It is aggregate plus a binder. Um, for the Romans, the binder was lime and volcanic ash from Potali in Italy. Um, uh, and there are new forms of concrete like hempcrete that rethinks aggregates and use strong fibers uh, of hemp as aggregate. Um, and our modern Portland cement concrete uses Portland cement, which is the most energy intense binder of all concretes so far. Um, and today we will see what earth grit is about. Uh, we'll discuss that. Um, and earth grit uses clay as a natural binder. It is raw clay. It is not heated at all. So how do we use these perspectives of what concrete is to inform a greater um, uh, intelligence uh, in sourcing materials for concrete? How do we use new materials? How do we use new supply chain mechanisms? How do you use critical thinking? Um, and um, uh, what's nice is that although each of these building materials were initially taken from earth, each of these materials are earth materials. Fiberglass comes from sand, steel from ore bearing rock and concrete from limestone. The thing is that they had to go through these complex processes to become the building products we know of uh, and uh, kind of increasing the amount of uh, processing, transportation, uh, between harvesting something at source and placing it into our buildings. So when I say earth or natural and living building materials, the definition I refer to is materials that are readily available, minimally processed. So we shrink down that supply chain um, that are non-toxic also those materials and community engaging. And sometimes I like to call them kind of farm to building materials. And specifically earth-based uh, uh, materials would be made of fibers that provide the tensile strength and those fibers would be weaved throughout the matrix, send or um, aggregate as a compressive strength provider like we know for uh, uh, conventional concrete and clay as the binder. And the various combinations of these constituent materials would provide a diversity of techniques and styles. And just to illustrate the diversity of um, the broad range of, um, for instance, um, styles and uh, also thermal possibilities here. Um, Cobb on the left um, is a monolithic sculptural technique. Round earth, uh, which uses formwork kind of to mimic the process of sedimentary rock creation. And then light straw clay that is an insulative infill um, tamped within a structural frame. 
let me close this window because there's so much noise outside. So, and of course, earth materials are very sustainable. They offer a waste-free life cycle, uh, but they're also very healthy for occupants and for builders. They are um, non-toxic and they act as a PRM, so passive removal materials for VOCs, as you can see here in the chart. Um, and what's a little different from the a uh, cured concrete or Portland cement concrete is that earthcretes have high hybrid capacity, uh, which makes them act as a flywheel of indoor relative humidity. So they provide kind of a, a, an optimal uh, relative humidity level for human health. And while it seems um, uh, totally out of our focus, earthcrete materials still shelter 3 billion people around the world. So it's a vernacular material in uh, Europe as it is in Africa. Um, and therefore we need to find ways to um, kind of enhance this material that has been proven in itself for over a millennia rather than replace it. Um, and of course, uh, earth materials are very community engaging and they can be dirt cheap because uh, we can use um, soil that is excavated for the foundation. Now, uh, I want to make uh, uh, an interesting discussion here about parallel to food. Uh, so just as you are what you eat rings true and have generated an immense industry of healthy foods, so do the spaces we live and work in affect our lives and health. Of course, now more than ever, we feel that. And the trend of claiming for healthier and low carbon spaces would only increase. So our responsibility as researchers, as engineers, designers, and building professionals is to ensure that these um, natural and living materials uh, follow a responsible growing practice, just as permaculture and sustainable farming for food, but for building materials. So, but before that happens, before the industry grows, earth materials currently are still non-commodified, which makes them very slow. As opposed to concrete that cures, earth concrete's dry. But the question is, can we slow down for a moment and ask, can slowness be a good thing? Uh, which is a funny question for me because I'm a very fast person. But um, um, looking at the slow food mo movement, for instance, um, um, which emerged as a response to industrialized fast food production, what we, uh, what they have recognized is that there's a need to preserve regional styles of food, to limit loss of material diversity, and to focus on the human nourishment rather than the crop yield. So very similarly in um, architectural design, um, um, prevailing construction trends are drawing us technologists towards high speed industrialized construction that is increasingly automated, capitalized, globalized and standardized, right? So in a way, the, the, glo the, the global goals of the slow food movements are as applicable to the production of space and shelter as they are to food. So kind of the slow construction movement, let's call it like that. So slowness can be useful uh, as a framework for developing not only alternative means of construction in a world that um, has finite physical resources and exponentially increasing computational capacity, but also as a more engaging and enjoyable self-capacity for building and maintaining our own structures. So can we use digital technologies to uh, uh, um, um, inform this notion, uh, take a long human centric view towards construction technology? So in this project, for instance, we demonstrated rammed earth designs uh, that extend and expand traditional craftsmanship um, and digital and analog uh, fabrication while repurposing local soils. We use utility functions related to environmental adaptation, uh, self-shading and self-cooling of the mass assemblies to develop these new surface tectonics for round earth, which is often very limited to linear surfaces. And we had great fun working with the material because working with earth, uh, I love concrete. I, and working with concrete is can be a little nasty with hands, which is why I more so lo love earthquakes. Um, um, and the best example for earthen structures can be found by designers, builders, like in these two houses. 
So that left staircase, um, um, I just love working with builders. I think builders are truly knowledgeable about uh, how best to use materials. They can really see uh, beyond the design, how the material behaves. Um, they have this intimate relationships uh, with the material that we as engineers and designers should adopt and learn from. But anyway, in this workshop, we produced this staircase that you can see here on the left. And there are tons of workshops. So just to, to show like a, a simple search here, endless workshops of cob, round earth, light straw clay. And this is because earth-based concretes are very easy to learn and self-build. It's very community engaging. But here also comes the problem. It starts with safety problems and poor construction practices and durability issues. And that leads to a perceptual problem with these materials being low tech, small scale and not viable for mainstream construction, which is notion that of course we need to challenge. And referring back to Sophia's notion on the life of the material, the bacterial and uh, living aspects of aging. One interesting thing about earthcretes is that um, life is part of the construction process. So for instance, builders of earthcretes know in vernacular practices that uh, they use the phenomena of sprouting earth walls to indicate when the wall dries. So when the sprouts wilt, that is when the wall is dry and ready for the finished layer. So in one of our projects, we started with the, this perception survey in a global context asking what people really think about earth and buildings. What is the problem? Uh, why isn't it mainstream? And what was astonishing to see is the strength of the perceptual barrier where 25% of experts uh, of earth buildings around the world indicated that there is a perceptual gap in the form of cultural prejudice and social perception. So how do we overcome this negative perception? We first use appropriate design and testing protocols. And you can see here on the right that appropriate design of earth buildings really means a good pair of boots and a nice umbrella. So a high footing and a deep proof hang to reduce rain driven erosion. And this photo was taken in New Mexico. You can see the snow footing here that uh, kind of stay away from the wall. And this is a, a raw clay um, uh, plaster 20 years of age, and it's amazing. There's also the perceived limited building height um, uh, on earth buildings, but actually earthen infills and uh, clay-based interior finishes can be applied at any scale, right? It, um, um, and those building technology solutions are developing in places like Germany and New Zealand where great earthen building codes exist. Um, there's also the technical gap that is required. Um, I won't dive into this too much today, but um, it had us um, develop a life cycle inventory for earth-based materials. And this is just an illustrator, illustration of the um, embodied phase results. I won't dive into the um, uh, operational phase results, but um, of course um, that was important to enumerate the enhanced performance of earth-based materials over conventionally insulated materials. We also investigated the thermal survivability in earth dwellings, uh, projecting on uh, predicted future um, um, climate scenarios. Uh, and we were astonished to discover that um, the heat and moisture flux mechanism uh, of earth uh, assemblies really increased the interaction with the surrounding humidity. Uh, which in turns create an intrinsic self-cooling capacity. And that was really interesting. And talking about survivability, eventually it's really about the hands-on working with these materials to gain self-sufficiency. In this project, uh, you can see me applying a final coat of cob uh, plaster to a shower that is made from adobe bricks. And this is the final outcome um, uh, finished with a layer of Tadillac, which is burnished lime, lime plaster and a tile mosaic. So just to wrap up my, uh, all those uh, interests, my current mission has been to really teach earthquakes to architects and engineers, um, having students really ask themselves, what does this material want to be? And how do you change your design based on the material behavior? How do you utilize locally available mass materials um, for with the community 
Um, and how do you combine material science and technologies without losing this, you know, vernacular hands-on enjoyment? Um, so these are the next generation of what I like to call con concretes, uh, earth-based, bacterial-based, self-healing, right? And they all require this additional thermal, perceptual, policy, environmental, and design innovations and educational avenues to be implemented in mainstream construction. And um, I think that is it for now for me. So thank you. Thanks so much, Lola. Fantastic. Sure. So talking about slowness, I hope I wasn't too fast. No, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll raise you your speed and I'll, I'll yeah. see your speed and raise your mind. Um, I have a quick question for you. Uh, it's not quite a clarification. It's just a comment while David sets up, which is continuing this conversation we're having this morning about the comparative aspect of materials that both epistemologically, the idea of a material is very strange things because a catalog of unlike things, steel and concrete and wood are supposed to be very unlike each other, but they have this in common that they are thought of as a material. And then, in, and then the discussion we were having about Material, new materials being announced as being in comparison to others, to older ones. Reinforced concrete better than, than unreinforced concrete, reinforced concrete more suitable than stone, et cetera. In your case, it seems to me Earthcrete invites comparison. Mm -hmm. You brand it as a concrete, mm -hmm. but it's a comparison that it can't possibly uphold and it doesn't want to uphold. I mean, it upholds some aspects of it, but it, in terms of the incredible triumphant performance of concrete and harmful performance of concrete over the last hundred years, let's say, Earthcrete is not trying to compete with that. So I'm just thinking about asking you like, and maybe, maybe you can answer later, but do you think of that designation as a material as strategic? Are you doing it because that's what people will understand? People want a material. They want a thing called a material. Or, right. or on the contrary, is it, mm -hmm. Does it truly help systemically because you're going to eventually take over um, mo modes of making specific infrastructure, you know, specific ways technologically that it makes sense to call it a material? So mm -hmm. it's kind of a question out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe I'll, it now. Yeah. Sure. I'll answer in short and then uh, along the discussion I can add up. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, I have a colleague who told me uh, um, about a producer, David Easton in, in California, who um, developed compressed earth, um, round earth bricks that um, have compressive strength um, um, as conventional concrete, which is uh, an absolutely amazing technological investment. And um, as he uh, um, uh, shared kind of the product with potential uh, um, 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 clients, he often heard, can you put just a little cement in it? So <laughs> there is that notion of, um, that the comparison or not possible, impossible comparison, right? To, you know, the um, um, concrete that lasts so long. Um, and that is one thought, but another thought is really, you're asking maybe why am I kind of trying to advance or a kind of, and it is a romantic view on a material. I agree that it, there, there is a romantic view here because I really love working with a material. Um, so it's also something mm -hmm. I would get also personal that I'm trying to kind of infect others. <laughs> in, that's a fine uh, answer too, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, yeah exactly. That's, Great. Uh, yeah. You you can easily stabilize earthen materials with a little bit of lime. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah. and it doesn't it doesn't give you the same increase in, in compressive strength that you're concerned about. But lime stabilized earthen materials, even for highway construction, have been used in this country for decades. And there's a big body of literature on this from the Florida Department of Highways, I believe, mm -hmm. and also the National Lime Association. Right. Yeah. And we're yeah, now exactly. developing uh, other types of um, stabilizing and reinforcing agents for earth uh, mm -hmm. that are um, could be even better for, yep. than lime. Yep. And, um, but there, there are so many avenues to um, advance this material. That's yeah. for sure. Apparently, even sticky rice mortar, according to the question yeah. in the chat. So we'll, but we'll come back to hopefully the broader discussion of the um, some of these alternative components, um, which takes us to David Benjamin. Um, 
thinking broadly about how systems feedback on themselves and the the some of these interesting and alternative nuances of uh, biological systems that might be leveraged kind of outside of maybe um, just the direct replacement of a material. Uh, not that that is not extremely important, but I think I'm excited to hear David give us some perspective on some of the amazing concepts and ideas that, they, that I think this picture represents very well. <laughs> thanks, David. Great. Um, thanks, Forrest. Thanks, Lucia. And uh, you know, thanks to all the other speakers for the exciting ideas and presentations of the event. Um, and in the spirit of uh, kind of the idea of af after concrete, or we could maybe also say beyond concrete, I'd like to take up um, Forrest and Lucia on the provocation to use concrete as a kind of trigger to think more broadly um, about materials, energy, and research in architecture, you know, as we've already heard uh, from uh, Kiel and Lola in this panel. Um, and I should say that I, I really love the premise of the event and the paper, in part because it's such a powerful illustration of the idea that buildings are really dynamic systems rather than static objects. Buildings are always changing. Buildings are not inert, uh, but rather they are perpetually exchanging with their environments in a wide range of ways. So in one sense, uh, buildings could be kind of like the forest as shown in this visualization of the invisible exchange of carbon shown in red and oxygen shown in blue, this kind of transformation of uh, energy and materials, sometimes at a kind of microscopic level. Um, and so for me, the question of how do we theorize materials and energy is not only linked to the question of how do we create technology for materials and energy, um, but it's also linked importantly to the question of how do we design with materials and energy. And this question in turn uh, is connected and intertwined with the question, how do we draw materials and energy? Um, so I'll come back to drawing in a few minutes, but I first want to describe some of my recent thinking about several different models of research for materials, energy, and technology and architecture that I think are relevant to this discussion. So here I'm thinking mainly about models for technology and the practice domain rather than the history and theory domain, um, but clearly some of these ideas might later be expanded. Um, and I should say, you know, I'm, I'm sure that all of these research models are familiar to everyone, so I'm not going to reveal anything new with the models, but I think it's helpful to, to list the models and consider them when we think about how to do some of the new and urgent work on concrete, on materials in general, and on energy. Um, so just briefly, the research model one could be funded uh, science and research. For example, university research funded by the National Science Foundation or something like ARPA-E. Um, this is related to concrete and other building materials, obviously. Um, and in fact, I'm actually right now working with ARPA-E on uh, helping to define a new track about carbon negative uh, building materials, I'm sorry, carbon negative buildings and building materials are a huge part of that, including a huge discussion about concrete. Uh, research model two, we could call this uh, industry and entrepreneurship. Uh, one example is BioMason, a startup company that's developed an alternative to concrete that's made through bacteria fusing aggregate into bricks with no heating and almost no carbon emissions. So uh, this kind of idea of industrializing uh, new research or research through uh, industry. Um, research model three, exhibitions and pavilions, you know, for example, the Venice Biennale coming up soon and other exhibitions, they offer, you know, a, a different model for engaging and experimenting with materials, sometimes concrete, sometimes concrete alternatives, also experimenting with more broadly with energy and of course, many other issues. Um, and research model four, uh, building commissions, you know, almost too obvious to mention, but, um, you know, for example, we see as, as uh, Kiel mentioned, uh, every day we're seeing new examples of timber structures, 
that are often positioned as an alternative to concrete structures. Um, and here the building commission can sometimes uh, be considered a, as a research project in itself. Um, so part of my point here is to say that often work uh, and research takes place primarily within a single model. Um, there are clearly some pathways between models, including from model one to model two, sometimes from model three to model four. Um, yet I think there could be more links between them and more paths through all of them. Uh, the models are not mutually exclusive. The models could be considered as a fluid system with feedback loops. And just as we uh, are learning to think holistically and system-wide in combining actions to address climate change, uh, we might also think holistically and system-wide in combining models to address materials and energy, combining these different research models. Um, and furthermore, I wanna propose a fifth category or model. This is a little um, less developed. Um, it's beyond the models we typically consider, which is drawing or more specifically drawing the invisible. So this is really um, the point of some of my uh, thoughts for this talk, which is to describe this model in a little bit more detail and tell you um, some different ways that uh, along with others that I've been thinking about it and working on it. Um, so the model of drawing uh, or drawing the invisible uh, includes drawing processes like uh, drawing energy and physical resources, drawing labor, drawing time. Um, and these are topics that we've been working on at Columbia GSAP for the past few years through the Embodied Energy and Design Project, including some related exhibitions, uh, related courses, a symposium a few years ago at the school, and the subsequent book uh, that came out of that symposium. Um, and in this project of starting to think about drawing embodied energy and drawing the invisible and in a way drawing materials and energy more generally, uh, we looked at some amazing precedents of drawing invisible but essential forces. Uh, we looked at uh, how who builds your architecture? The kind of advocacy group is, has been working with drawing labor in architecture. Uh, we looked at some precedents of drawing time, including Bernard Schumi's fireworks at Parc de la Villette. Um, and we looked at some more recent and experimental ideas like uh, drawing uh, clouds of microbes uh, in the city. Uh, this is some work by Kevin Slavin and the Playful Systems Lab. And when we turn to embodied energy, um, we started our analysis, uh, including our work on the embodied energy in concrete, through trying to draw data visualizations. Um, so a, a, a visualization like this uh, shows us graphically that buildings account for a third or more of global waste, energy consumption, and carbon emissions. Um, this kind of drawing shows us that embodied energy defined as the energy required to extract, produce, transport, and assemble materials into buildings. Embodied energy has been increasing over time. Uh, here's a data visualization or a drawing showing the breakdown of embodied energy by material. So looking at embodied energy in either concrete or aluminum or glass and comparing those. Uh, here's a different visualization showing the breakdown of embodied energy by building components, such as structure, envelope, finishes. Yet another one showing the breakdown by process, things like extraction, transportation, and manufacturing. And here's a drawing uh, comparing specific buildings. For example, in a recent case study, a new timber tower involved slightly less embodied energy, but about 75% less embodied carbon than our comparable 50-year-old concrete and steel tower. And finally, um, this kind of visualization translates some of the numbers of embodied energy into quantities that are more intuitive. So if we look at the amount of embodied energy in the new, relatively new Shanghai tower, we could convert that to 34 million cars on the road for a day, or 481 million uh, pounds of coal burned. So this kind of um, making it more tangible um, to some of our everyday life. 
Um, but part of the point that I'm trying to make here is that we quickly realized that data alone was not enough. Uh, and drawing the data, drawing the quantitative was not enough. We also needed to understand some of the qualitative and relational aspects of embodied energy. So we moved to drawing what we call material stories, the narrative of a material like concrete or wood or steel, the narrative and the story from extraction to factory production, to transportation, to construction. Um, so here's the material story of concrete, trying to draw within the same drawing, within the same frame, um, the entire story kind of over time and over space of a single material like concrete. Um, and you know, here's an example of uh, doing the same thing, uh, drawing the material story for a different material, uh, which is steel. And yet another one drawing the material story of wood as an architectural material. Um, and we use this kind of framework um, to draw questions as much as we were um, using it to draw conclusions. Um, so we drew uh, a range of material formations and sites beyond what we typically consider to be the building, beyond what we typically consider as part of what the architect would design. So for example, here is the site of a limestone quarry, the site of a cement silo with corresponding kind of uh, markups in red, uh, the building foundation, and the concrete structure. So several different sites involved in the material story of concrete. Um, similarly, you know, if we think about steel, here's uh, the site of uh, iron ore extraction for steel, the site of a steel former, a container ship, a steel yard, and a steel structure. And likewise, I think you see where I'm going here. For wood, here is a forest, a sawmill, a lumber yard, and the balloon frame structure of the building. So uh, these drawings, these material stories, uh, reveal something important about our buildings. They're a research model beyond the quantitative, but also different than the historical, even though they're narrative, uh, like history. Um, and uh, they're not just analytical, they're not just meant to be analytical tools, but they can also be used as tools for design, active uh, working tools for the design of buildings. Um, furthermore, um, the framework of embodied energy is not just an underexplored aspect of architecture, but uh, it's also a lens through which we might see all kinds of invisible but essential features of architecture, such as embodied water, embodied carbon, or embodied labor. So finally, um, I just want to mention that these methods and processes of drawing have informed my own small architectural practice at the living. Um, they were part of some of our early work with a new material, a mycelium brick, um, that in some ways could be understood as an alternative to concrete, uh, a structural brick that has almost no embodied energy, no carbon emissions and no waste, and a brick that is compostable so that at the end of its useful life, it can return to the earth and into a productive ecosystem. So this kind of project intersects with model three, exhibitions and pavilions. Um, and here our drawings are really experiments with drawing time, drawing decay, and drawing the transformation of matter and energy. Um, and similarly, this drawing process was also part of uh, some of our more recent projects uh, in our firm, uh, including the design of the Embodied Computation Lab at Princeton. Forrest mentioned this building. We work closely with Forrest and others on this. Um, it's a building that was made in large part through wood. Uh, this project intersects with model four that I was mentioning, building commissions. Um, and it involves things like drawing, sourcing, drawing fabrication, 
drawing installation and drawing objects. So here we designed the transformation of materials over time, starting with a repurposed material, uh, which were New York City scaffolding boards, shown here kind of being uh, taken down from a construction site, um, then handling the physical materials, Um, and then uh, using a kind of algorithmic process of machine learning and a new form of drawing to reveal some of the forgotten aspects of the material, to visualize time in a way, to see how each board, each scaffolding board comes from a specific place, a specific resource, a specific tree that grew in specific conditions and formed in specific ways. Um, and then uh, in the physical object of the building, and this kind of drawing that we're making of that object, uh, the facade registers the, the story of the material. It's a kind of embodiment of the material story from resource extraction to initial use as scaffolding to computational analysis and uh, identification of unique features to a certain kind of selective fabrication to eventual reuse as a building facade. And maybe more fundamentally, this kind of drawing and this kind of including the drawing and the design process allowed us to develop a new perspective on buildings as really just a temporary formulation of materials, energy, and labor connected to other formulations before and after the life of the building. So finally, in a kind of feedback loop, um, these methods and processes are now part of a new line of experimentation that we've been doing with um, what we're sometimes calling multi-species architecture. And this is back to model three um, exhibitions. Uh, and here we're thinking about the invisible microbial world. Um, microbes are everywhere in the built environment. They're in the air, on our bodies, and even in our architecture and in our concrete, as Sophia mentioned earlier. Um, and just as we're increasingly aware of the bacteria in our own bodies and the way a gut microbiome uh, contributes to our individual health, we might also start paying attention to the bacteria in our cities and the way an urban microbiome contributes to our collective health. Uh, it turns out that a diverse community of microbes tends to create a healthier environment, and some materials can be better than others at provoke, promoting this kind of diverse microbial community that we want, um, maybe better than others at creating what we could call probiotic architecture. So uh, there are some experiments with bioreceptive concrete um, that are uh, working on these kind of ideas. Um, and there are also other bioreceptive materials that can be uh, designed and drawn. So in this project for storefront for art and architecture, we experimented with wood as one example of a bioreceptive material. Um, and here in this project, in this experiment, uh, we actually swabbed the material, then sequenced the DNA that was in the architecture, on the architecture, in the material. Uh, and we visualized the output through a, a strange type of drawing shown here um, and tried to derive insights about the types of microbes on different kinds of materials and in different neighborhoods of the city. So this was an experiment in drawing the invisible layer of microbes that are part of our materials and our energy ecosystems. Um, and uh, uh, finally, um, here's a, a, another experiment along those lines that we're currently doing uh, for the Venice Architecture Biennale, which opens in two weeks, where we're experimenting with uh, yet another bioreceptive material and another method of drawing. Um, so really to conclude, um, the idea is that we're expanding from concrete to other materials and also expanding from materials designed uh, to change and materials that are designed to age um, to also experimenting with materials that are designed to exchange and materials that are designed to nourish. So I suppose my concluding hypothesis is that we might discover new understandings of materials and energy, and uh, also new forms of action in the face of things like climate change through new forms of drawing. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Fantastic, I look forward to 
engaging in conversation with Sophia. Um, and also with, with, actually I was thinking while you're showing the drawings with Kiel in terms of how the drawings might inform this idea of life cycle, not really <laughs> being often not including a lot of the things that you actually are able to draw representationally. So, so thanks for that. Um, I think there was there a couple questions. Uh, oh no, just good job <laughs> in the comments. Um, so I think we have another great transition here. Um, to feel like unless Lucia, you had a, any question for David specifically. So I'll hold. I'll hold in the end. Okay. I'll hold yeah, on. I'm looking for the discussion. Everything I think is you know coming together almost too well. Um, um, so I'm, I'm extremely excited also to get to introduce my, my friend Felix Heisel, who survived the Singapore heat with me over a few years of research. Um, uh, my part being probably failing to cool things well enough for him, but in his part, uh, developing an awesome intellectual framework to rethink materials in the circular, circular economy. And he's now continuing that um, at Cornell in the Circular Construction Lab. And uh, I'm really excited to, to bring him in to give us some of the perspective on how this context of materials is actually the one where we can mine and rethink sort of some of these sources and sites, which I think will build wonderfully on the story of our mining of scaffolding boards and going much further than that. So thanks, Felix. I'm very excited to have you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucia and Forrest, for inviting me. Um, thank you, all the other panelists before me. It's an incredibly interesting conversation, and I'm looking forward to the panel afterwards. Um, I wanted to talk today about the, the circular economy, or specifically construction in the framework of a circular economy, um, with a little bit of focus on, on questions of design with uh, projects that came out of our lab and um, in my office. So all of this is, is teamwork. Um, just as a disclaimer, I'm the, the one that gets to talk about it. But of course, there's a, a big team of um, students and, and colleagues behind this. Um, since we're talking about time so much, I want to start quickly with a much larger time scale. Um, going back 800,000 years, um, the planet has really been controlled for the last 800,000 years by what is called the Milankovitch cycles. And I'm sure I'm not telling most of you anything new here, but I think it is important to set this up um, to show the importance of that paradigm shift that we're hopefully working towards. Um, and so um, within this, then looking at the influence of humans in the last 70 years, um, and how the influence of humans suddenly became more important in, in uh, how, the, how the planet behaves um, is, is incredibly um, thought-provoking and scary, right? Um, and it, it really doesn't matter which of these charts we look at. They're all essentially similar. They're exponential. They start somewhere in the 1950s. Um, and this is because this is then the reason why we talk about the Anthropocene with a starting point around that time. Um, if we look at one of these charts a bit more specifically, then it's the extraction of um, global resources. Uh, the magenta here being what is allocated for the built environment. And uh, I'm sorry that these are German, but the left side really talks about the total extraction. And on the right side, I think it's important to also look at the per capita extraction because you could say, well, this is all due just to the fact that we have a, an increase in population, um, but in fact, also the per capita um, consumption of resources, especially in the built environment has been increasing since again, the 1950s dramatically. Um, and within this linear system that we're, that we're working or, or um, building in at the moment, the built environment really stands for 50% of resource extraction, 50% of solid waste production, um, and arguably, arguably even 50% of um, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, this year saying 40, but the newest numbers are, are, are even higher. Um, and, and so, if we look at this, this kind of scary numbers, um, of course, the question that we have to ask ourselves is what is the, why do we do this, right? What is the service time of all of these materials before they, from the beginning of that linear um, use till the end? Um, and um, 
we're, we're as architects, we sometimes think that we build for eternity. Um, Brunelleschi had formulated this already in 1380 or something like that, 1390, um, when he built uh, the, the Florence Dome. Um, but of course, the reality is um, that this time is much more somewhere around 50 in China. Um, we're now talking about a, a service time of buildings of, of 25 years. Um, and so looking at this in a much more specific uh, angle about which element of which building actually has what kind of service time and how can we then compare the service time with the lifetime of buildings, right, uh, which are something completely different um, is, is, I guess, the big question to ask. And so one of the solutions that we're talking about that, that can do the shift is really talk about a circular economy where we maximize kind of the, the usability in several cycles of materials, um, where we separate the technical from the biological um, cycles. And I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, and of course, drive the system with regenerative sources because only then um, we actually have a kind of um, circular economy. Um, and, and if you try to define the circular economy, I guess one of the important words in that definition is the word design. So a circular economy is a restorative and regenerative system by design, right? And this is for me a, a call to action for, for all of us to, to go to the beginning of the cycle and really think about how can we do things differently? How can we design waste out of the system and keep all products at their highest utility and value um, throughout their, their service and their lifetimes. Um, and so this is what we're doing at the, at the Circular Construction Lab. We're looking at the one side, of course, at the, the big question, what do we do with everything that is already out there? Um, so I guess in, in uh, the question that Lucia asked for earlier, what is the other there, right? For me, the other there is the built environment as it stands, kind of the existing buildings out there and how can we in include those or bring those back into, um, into the system. And then the other question looking forward, how do we design differently from now on that we don't have this problem that we talk about material management and a kind of an asset management where we take things out of one building and move them to the next without having um, uh, any, any losses in that step. Um, and the third part that I'm quickly going to address today in this talk is the question, what do we need to, to make this um, possible? What kind of tools or, or software or thinking um, stands behind that? Um, so th the first of these, um, uh, also often referred to as urban mining, um, is, is all of these are basically not new ideas. Um, the first time urban mining was mentioned um, in, in this kind of... Um, going back in, in literature is by, by Jane Jacobs in her 1969 publication, The Economy of Cities, where she speaks about uh, kind of uh, prophetically about the, the city of the future being the largest, most prosperous and richest mine that can be easily, most easy worked on and is inexhaustible, right? Because it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it, keeps, it keeps fulfilling um, its um, its source, or it keeps filling its source and, and reactivating the source. And to a certain extent, we we've reached that point. These are studies um, from from Japan, where where we see uh, this now specifically talking about metals. That the amount of metals that are already in the in the built environment exceeds the current known underground reserve of these metals. Um, the problem in this way of looking at it is that, of course, none of these components were designed for reuse or very little of those, right? This is the, the more common way of, um, of demolition. Um, so the end of, of um, life of buildings. Um, and it is in incredibly hard to, to reactivate any of these sources if this is the common technology, right? And so the, the question that we need to ask is what are new technologies, what are new ways of activating the, the resource that we have available, um, even if it, it hasn't been planned for this kind of scenario. 
Um, and one, one little project that we've done uh, in 2019 is called the Mehrwert Pavilion. Um, this basically goes to David's Model 3, um, the pavilion building as a research, um, where we built um, this pavilion only out of resources that were already um, in the built environment. Everything that you see here had a second, a third or a fourth life already in, uh, before it, it um, arrived in this building. Um, and we categorized it in, in four categories. All the ground is made out of mineral demolition waste, then all the furniture is made out of recycled household plastics. Um, the, the framework, the structural components are out of reused steel, emphasis on reuse. Um, uh, that's the much more <laughs> difficult part um, since steel usually is already to 90%, 80% recycled, of course. Um, and then the, the roof and the facade is made out of recycled glass. Um, and when you zoom in closer, you see that this, of course, brings with it the kind of history of that material here, of course, as, as part of a um, pavilion structure, a, a bit over um, uh, oh, the focus is on that aspect, of course, but especially this glass texture, for example, where you see these old, um, uh, in this case, wine bottles that create this wonderful texture and that bring in these, these shards of glass, um, I think bring, adds a, a new dimension to our material palette um, that is extremely important in the way we design future buildings. Um, and the second important element about this pavilion was that we actually um, took out all the steel from a decommissioned coal fire plant, um, power plant that uh, in, in Germany is all being shut down right now um, because of the change to renewable energy sources. And, and so these uh, immense mines are, are being blown up with a lot of um, yeah, very little care to the material. And we managed to take out some of these um, steel, uh, structural steel elements, but we had no idea what the steel is. We didn't know what type of steel, how long it's been there, what happened to it during the lifetime. And so bringing that into the German building code um, required significant amount of, of testing, um, batch testing, uh, tensile testing, uh, notch testing, uh, chemical composition, uh, weldability, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to then prove in the end that this is standard structural steel. Um, and, and can be easily used in, in this pavilion. Um, and so the need for documentation, um, and I get to that in a little while, um, is, is another really important aspect of that, um, of that um, shift towards a circular economy. Um, and then of course, coming back to the design, um, the, the length of the elements that we took out of this pavilion, of course, then de defined for us um, the structural a uh, tree-like um, uh, assembly of, of this pavilion um, and something that would probably look different if we would have gotten that steel from a normal, um, normal supply chain. Um, a, a second very quick example is then directed towards how do we design differently um, looking at the future. This is um, the urban mining recycling unit uh, that we built in Switzerland. Um, um, what, what we're looking at is just this, this unit in the middle that has this copper frame around it. And here we um, went uh, into that building with a brief to, to construct something that is 100% recyclable. So all connections, everything that went in there um, has to be able to go back into their material loops at the end of the service time of that building which then resulted in three, in these three cycles of this butterfly diagram here on the right side, a kind of biological metabolism that is much bigger um, than the material itself, right? So the timber can turn into a mycelium-based uh, component or, or grass or, you know, something else that isn't um, part of the built environment. On the left side, you have this very direct um, reuse and recycling um, of technical components, uh, as the example of the glass shows. But the biggest question, of course, is how do you do this um, in, an, in, an, in a way that um, um, in, in a way that uh, that really brings out the quality of that of that space, right? We we want to live in, in a kind of aesthetically pleasing environment. 
um, but still talks about the history of the materials and about the, the way this moving forward, this can be disassembled. Um, and so this is a modular, a modular unit built out of seven uh, completely prefabricated elements um, that were then only assembled on site with a couple screws and can of course the same way be dis disassembled, taken out of the building site again, and then all the materials salvaged and returned into their specific cycles. So the design for disassembly here is the main component already in, in the development of the architecture. Um, and one example that describes this best are the, the bathrooms. How do you build something that is waterproof, right? a shower without the use of any adhesive, without the use of any silicone, no glues, any, nothing, kind of no chemical adhesives, right? And so this is all just dry gaskets, uh, just compression, um, one screw, you, to, you, you just loosen that, take it apart again. Um, and, and so you have um, the clean and sorted and monomaterial um, cycles again at the end of that, of that building. Um, and again, the, the kind of beauty of the aesthetic of these, of these materials. Um, the circular economy also um, talks a lot about new business models, right? The moment we develop materials on products that are fully recyclable, of course, we can use them differently. We can lease them, we can rent them, um, we can uh, bring an extended period to the liability. So the, this example here, for, for example, is a carpet um, that we only lease for eight years and then return to the producer. The producer, because of that, can then um, anticipate a resource for their production in eight years. They know this is coming back um, and they can plan with that and reduce their, um, their dependency on volatile resource markets. And then just as mentioned before, the importance of documentation. Um, this is a, a kind of set of material passports that we developed for this building to know exactly which product is where, um, uh, in which amounts, when will it be available again? And of course, the question is, how do you do that for the urban mine? So at the lab, we're right now developing new tools with using augmented reality, for example, to, to ease the deconstruction process and to estimate material amounts and really always thinking about how can we, can we close this gap between supply and demand moving forward um, in, in a kind of new design um, understanding where the resource for the design really is what is already available in our cities. And that, of course, then also relates to the question, to an urban question, right? Because we have to do this not on one building at a time, but really match between buildings across the city. Um, and so that's my, my last slide here, trying to show that um, on a little study for Ithaca in, in upstate New York, where we um, now estimated all the um, uh, compare the operational and the embodied carbon emissions um, for, for each building, but of course re relying on a very detailed model um, that we that we semi-automatically constructed from GIS data and LIDAR data, etc., to estimate you know what is in which building and how can we match these buildings moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. Fantastic. I think um, another great set of examples um, and context, I think, to bring into the, the picture and the debate um, about exactly where you close the edges of your loop, I guess. This is the thing I think that in every presentation, I, I think we've all seen something where we're going to come to the end and be like, well, what about the crane in the picture? Or what about the, um, and I think that's, I think I'm glad we, uh, we had Kiel to sort of lead us off to think in that way, but I think it helps us to recognize just how important it is to be doing this hard work of thinking about the broader systems and scope. So thanks so much again for those. Really beautiful too. I mean, I think one thing that hasn't been represented considering we're at an architecture school, and maybe I'm not the person that should say this, but there is a role for aesthetics and making things last a certain amount of time and have importance. Um, so I don't think we should try not to forget that. But with that architectural reference, now I'm going to shift to my good engineering friend, Dan Steingart, um, who was my, in, in some ways, mentor in how to be an open-minded engineering thinker as he sat behind the wall right over there uh, next to me for several years. 
Um, and he's now though the co-director of the Columbia Electrochemical Energy Center, um, which speaks to his expertise directly as a thinker around how we store energy in materials. Um, and the first project we actually worked together on was a pretty wild idea about storing energy in concrete, um, which is more about asking questions that may be a little bit crazy um, and seeing where they go. Um, he's now a, a professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Engineering. And I just wanna point out, cause we realized this was relevant when we were all meeting this morning, um, that that's actually the department that used to be for mining at Columbia. And I find it very appropriate that now we have Dan here to talk about energy, which kind of speaks to how we've transferred from an age of material resources to one of energy resources. And I think that's kind of where we want to arrive at the end of our narrative arc for the conference. So thanks, Dan, um, for agreeing to join us in maybe not the typical kind of conference you would be a part of. But uh, I know, uh, having been a part of many talks with you, that it's going to be fantastic. So take it away, my friend. Uh, th th thank you, Forrest and Lucia, for the for the really kind uh, invitation, and, and um, I feel very outclassed here. It's a real honor to to, to be part of this this super interesting conversation. Um, uh, uh, as a as a uh, ac academic engineer and and, and uh, partially a practicing engineer, I'm, um, I'm trying to avoid the puns here, but but I'm going to be a bit more concrete on concrete and um, and talk talk about. Something that Forrest uh, motivated, and, and it's, it's a lot of energy go, goes into concrete, but, but can we get energy uh, um, um, from concrete? And so can concrete produce energy even in a, a secondary fashion? Are, are my slides showing up okay here? Is, is, is the right? Looking good. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, so can, can concrete uh, 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 produce energy? And, and perhaps a better question, and, and, and I'll motivate this why in, 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 in a few slides is, 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 is should, should concrete produce energy? We, we've heard um, many times over the course of, of uh, um, uh, the day that concrete uh, is dynamic. It's dynamic on, on, on time scales that, that we typically don't think about in, in uh, uh, batteries, or at least in energy storage and energy production. We think about cycling over days, months, weeks, and years, but um, there's significant structural change within a battery over that cycle. Um, and uh, the structural change of, of concrete, we hope, is over a long period of time if we're going to amortize its cost to the earth and, and, and cost to the atmosphere. Um, Anything that produces energy is, is at some way out of equilibrium with its environment. And, and um, meaning that, that it, it reacts with its environment or it reacts within its system to reach some sort of equilibrium um, after which it can no longer provide energy. So we can recharge the system. We can do this thermally. We can do this electrically. We can do this chemically so that, that it's once again out of equilibrium and that energy can be exploited once again. But uh, the question is, 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 can what we expect concrete to do, do this? Is there a positive couple? Is there a positive synergy here? Um, uh, uh, and so when the energy is spent, the system is in this equilibrium. So can we have our concrete within a system, which is taking up a lot of mass, and can it uh, be o overloaded. And so this, this isn't allegorical. The, the components of, of concrete um, uh, are metals that have been stripped of their ability to do what we expect metals to do. Uh, uh, they break rather than bend. They no longer conduct electricity. They're no longer reactive surfaces in, in the same way. The, the terminology that, that's been used here, I'm going to use the term oxidation to cover it all. The oxidation through carbonation uh, uh, typically, unless we engineer it very precisely in a very particular way, generally means that, that the materials are, are no longer reactive. And, uh, functionally, this is a benefit of concrete because even though it does age, even though it, 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 it slowly uh, loses the properties that, 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 that we wanted to have initially, 
uh, that process is slow enough uh, to, to be blunt, to, to make someone some money for a certain amount of time and to have a building do what it's supposed to do for a certain amount of time. And um, uh, the, the question is, is, is can what a battery needs to do, which is react very quickly in this time scale, somehow positively coupled to this. Um, um, this change of uh, metals is inevitable. I think about my PhD advisor, who was a metallurgist, and uh, his partner, who was the chief ceramicist for, for NASA. And they would have these very cute arguments that a metal um, just wants to be an oxide, or an oxide is, is just an impure metal. And you know, this, this made for, for very fun Christmas dinners. But the, the idea is that, is that concrete is um, a wonderful engineering material because it, uh, at least in the beginning of its life, interacts in, in a positive manner with uh, its surrounding environment. And then a, a, a long-term question that, that uh, Claire White, who um, I believe many of you know, uh, thinks about is, is how can the functional life of a, a, a concrete be extended through carbonation rather than deteriorated? So this is an interesting long-term question, but it's this inevitability that makes the uh, uh, battery um, um, uh, worthwhile and uh, it, rather it, that makes the concrete behave so so well in, in, in my estimation. And so this is uh, um, um, uh, 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 a, a beauty of the engineered structure. If it's not done well, oxidation is just rush, right? So, so what I'll say is this, chaotic corrosion um, and chaotic oxidation creates brittle structures. So, so when a, a steel structure is not properly uh, protected and when steel structure is uh, uh, left uh, to a human environment, it uh, corrodes um, and passivates in such a way that, that leads to a lack of structural integrity. Um, but a, a well-baked concrete uh, does, does the opposite. So the question is, 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 can this energy that goes into baking concrete be taken out or partially taken out so this building structure can both provide uh, support while also providing energy? And so uh, let me talk about batteries a little bit, what a battery is, is supposed to do. Um, a battery needs to cycle in some way, shape, or form between uh, 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 metallic and oxide ideals. And, and, and you can picture this as becoming concrete and becoming um, um, steel. And, 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 and you th may think I'm using the term concrete loosely here, but when I show you a an SEM micrograph of, of uh, the guts of a AA battery in a few slides, you'll notice that the morphology and the particle matrix structure really does invoke concrete. Um, uh, when a battery dies, when a battery is no longer cyclable, when we can no longer put energy into it nor get energy out, um, um, the process by which the battery dies is very similar to the process by which concrete is, is cured. It's this oxidation process that successfully passivates interfaces from further oxidation. Um, so sometimes this can last thousands of oxidized interface um, uh, thousands of times. And sometimes um, 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 this, this, this only lasts once. The terminology I'm using for concrete here, just because um, um, I, I want to make sure what I'm about to say um, makes a, a bit more sense. Uh, um, it's some type of a particle, sand, crushed stone, gravel, in, in a binder. And it's the chemical reaction and, and thermal activation of this binder that cures it in, in, in air or, or air analogous atmosphere. And Again, the goal is to prevent surface activity. So, 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 uh, 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 for batteries, uh, this is this is a bad thing. For for for, for 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 structures, this is typically a good thing. This is a bad thing for batteries because we need these interfaces to be active. So, if we look at this um, uh, micrograph 
and we see um, um, uh, 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 where IP and OP are pointing, the edges of those particles within a battery are continuously trading electrons and ions to store and release energy. And as they do so, the mechanical properties change in a significant way. Um, both at a nanoscale and at a, 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 a microscopic and macroscopic state. Um, and if you don't think about a, a battery as a reversible mechanical device or a device that has significant mechanical consequences as it operates, uh, let me share this video with you um, 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 that, it, that will invoke this structure um, um, in the slide after. Um, I spent, I want to say, uh, at least a decade of my life trying to get a AA battery to be rechargeable, to take the batteries that we buy and use once in our remote controls and flashlights, and to see what happens when you put, try to put electricity back into it. Um, because the chemical reactions on paper are, are reversible, but it's the structure within um, and the nature of the chemical reaction, the physical consequences of the chemical reaction that, that determine in large part whether or not we can, we can reverse these structures. And um, I would tell my friends this, and, and one of my friends sent me um, a video that highlighted what you're going to see in column 100 and column zero. And what my group did was to, to run the, the interstitials. And so what we did here was take a AA battery uh, and we discharged it 10%. And then we ran this experiment where we simply dropped the battery. And when we dropped this battery and it was new and it wasn't discharged, it wouldn't bounce. And when the battery, uh, 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 when we discharged the battery uh, beyond uh, uh, taking 20% uh, of its capacity out, it starts to bounce a little bit and then, and then the bouncing levels off. And, and this was unexpected. Um, when I saw the initial bounce video, because I had been studying the structure of these batteries for, for, for 10 years, it didn't surprise me too much for what I'm about to show you. But the fact that it changed in this manner was, was quite eye-opening and actually helped us explain um, a failure mechanism. And the failure mechanism was actually directly analogous to, to concrete. Um, that is to say that if I had a battery and I only took 20% of the energy out of this battery and put that 20% back in, I could run that cycle thousands of times with this particular tester. But if I took 50% of the energy out and tried to put it back in, it simply wouldn't accept the energy. And here's why. The structure of the battery, particularly the, the zinc anode, this is what the structure looks like when it is uh, um, fresh, when we first open the package and or, or, or as built. Um, notice that there's a significant amount of porosity. These particles are, 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 are loosely connected. Even in the preparation of this micrograph, we oxidized it. And so you see that this structure looks more akin to, to the concrete that, that we would expect to be a structural material. Um, and, and this does not, this would be a, a poorly cured uh, um, uh, material more akin to um, gravel or something like this. In the discharge state, the zinc is fully oxidized and we um, uh, see that, that uh, there is very little uh, 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 porosity and the interfaces are almost all gone. And so what happens as we discharge this structure is that the loosely packed zinc oxidizes and the potassium hydroxide, which is a, a binder for, for modern carbon-free concretes, um, uh, uh, reacts with uh, oxygen that's made available through the counter electrode. And we get this pore filling reaction that prevents the zinc from reacting anymore. So we're forming a kind of concrete within the battery and the formation of this concrete is what prevents the battery from, from ever working again. So I was trying to come up with ways of, of reversing this and um, at, I was getting to know Forrest and, and Claire at the time and, 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 and um, uh, 
the question was, is, is, is if this is really analogous to concrete and this carbonation, as I was learning, is a problem for concrete. So it's the, the, the oxidation then going to carbonation is a challenge for the structure of concretes. Can we positively couple these things, put electricity into these structures to reverse the carbonation or partially reverse the oxidation of rebar and um, um, get to a point where the system uh, can continually take and, and accept electrons even in a partially oxidized state, but not taking it all the way. So if you can imagine having a wall constantly attached to the grid, constantly accepting and giving small amounts of electricity, breathing electricity, if, if, if you will, to maintain its physical structure. Um, and so we call this project overloaded structures. And the idea is, 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 is simply this, taking two forms of iron um, and, and, and earth abundant materials. One is, is iron uh, uh, oxyhydroxide. Um, the other is iron mixed with manganese dioxide. And manganese dioxide is, is a, um, a, a, a material that is co-extracted with iron. So it actually makes a better use of, of iron tailings. And the question was, is, is can we design this so that the rebar would be the active electrode within the system and the porous concrete or the porous uh, 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 rocks, uh, 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 rock-like structures around the rebar uh, would be flooded with uh, uh, solvent because uh, uh, concrete, as I understand it, likes to be very dry or very wet, but not somewhere in between. And by operating this, we can constantly refresh the structure. So things got pretty weird because the carbonates um, still formed. And we then looked into how we can cycle carbonates. And, 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 and carbonates are really the deadest of the dead, I, I, I've learned. As these carbonates form, they're very hard to electrochemically reverse. And, and um, when we talk about how to deal with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's, it's of the same problem. If, if we can simply run an electrochemical reaction to split carbon from oxygen by leaving electrodes out, we would. It turns out that carbon dioxide is just exceptionally stable stuff. And this is, this is uh, one of the main triggers of, 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 or one of the main reasons why reversing climate change is, is, is gonna be so challenging. Um, so what, what's, what's interesting though is that carbonates can even be toxic. And so rat poison is a specific kind of carbonate. We said, huh, the, the structure that we're creating here is, is sort of similar to, 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 to rat poison. Uh, because rat poison is toxic, this indicates that it might be uh, chemically available and therefore electrochemically available. So uh, we wrote a paper on, on electrochemically cycling a version of rat poison that, that actually worked okay, but, but it still eventually died. <laughs> So eventually, by cycling the rat poison, it stopped being rat poison, it stopped being toxic, which also meant it stopped being chemically active. So, so the problem um, had layers of complexity that, that, that even after studying it for, for, for a decade, I didn't realize until we tried to make this, this concrete battery. Um, so, so this was required co context because I, I had been implicitly trying to reverse a, 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 a these concrete-like structures that formed in batteries for years and years and years. And uh, I had been doing so because the way batteries have been designed forever since uh, the first uh, uh, modern electrochemical cells in, uh, uh, were developed in, 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 in 1800 by Danielle and Volta, um, they were designed to fail in this way. And so I'm going to invoke two key terms in electrochemistry, corrosion and passivation. And we, when we design a battery, we implicitly choose passivation over corrosion because the energy that's available in the battery remains accessible for longer for a one-use operation if the battery fails via passivation rather than failing via corrosion. Uh, the, the way to think about this is the, the silly Duracell ads where they say the battery is gonna last for 10 years. Um, they designed the battery to slowly passivate over this 10 years rather than quickly corroding because 
you're not intended or that battery is not designed to take the electrons back. And so by designing a passivation uh, a failure mechanism, the, the self-discharge of the system uh, uh, is, is, is much slower. And we've been doing this for 200 years. So as I was trying to reverse the concretization of these batteries, I realized that we were trying to do this. Um, uh, we've been fighting this natural and almost inevitable phenomenon for 200 years um, um, without making too much headway towards it. Uh, and the way the concrete forms is exceptionally complicated within the battery, just like it is outside the battery. And this is why we need neutrons and x-rays to study it um, 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 even today. But this got me thinking about the implicit design of a battery and, and the fact that it was designed to passivate because when the battery was first invented in 1800, there was no electric grid. There was no way to readily recharge it. And so we wanted the electrons to always be available from this system. Now, in 2015, when I started this work, 2021 for sure, when we think about batteries that back up the grid, they're always connected to the grid. They almost always will have a source of electrons every day. If we think about uh, supplying enough stored electricity to compensate for the stochastic nature of wind uh, uh, and, 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 and solar energy, the battery will always be accepting electrons, but the priority is to not accept electrons, but give electrons. So we said, let's redesign the battery from scratch and make it so that rechargeability is, is um, um, number one with a bullet. And so we designed a battery to avoid passivation at all costs. And we looked for chemical systems that can do this. And we stumbled upon bromine, which is nasty stuff in its own way, but wonderful stuff in, in another way. Um, bromine, you can think about as liquid oxygen. Uh, it is more oxidizing than oxygen, but in its natural state, it's a liquid rather than a gas. And that gives it uh, um, um, uh, uh, key physical properties that, that, that enhance corrosion rates rather than has, enhancing passivation rates. So, so by making a battery specifically to avoid concretization, what we saw was that um, we can make a battery that could be cycled forever while doing what a battery was not supposed to do 200 years ago. And so this is a cross section of this battery that, that we designed. Um, and it is charging and discharging. It's constantly short circuiting. It's constantly corroding, but it is always available to accept and give electrons and its behavior can be quite predictable. And so this is a very new way of making batteries, but we're developing the, the, the transport um, um, uh, models and, and an electrochemical understanding of this sort of as we speak, I've got a big project in my lab on doing this. And, and again, the entire point of this system was to avoid forming concrete because by avoid, avoid forming a type of concrete within the battery, again, it, it would last forever. So I guess after this study, what I realized is that, is that in many ways a concrete battery is an oxymoron because the, the, the very aspects of concrete that, that we know and love um, in terms of its structural performance uh, inherently make it difficult to reverse the energetics of it. Now, maybe this is possible, but, but it's quite challenging. And by taking this understanding of what concrete is and how concrete forms and designing a battery to avoid this at all costs, we invented a new way of storing energy um, um, that, that may um, hopefully have a, 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 a better, I'm going to avoid the word life cycle analysis uh, uh, because I, I, I agree with that critique uh, uh, 100%, but may have a, a better amortization schedule. Uh, so, so thanks so much um, uh, again for, for the really kind invitation and having me today. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Dan. I like that you felt the need to define for us what concrete, how you are using the word concrete, as though we were somehow police that. Uh, but it's so great to have this as a capping to the conversation on essentially energy, like the all the panel we've heard 
direct the conversation to energy and this has completely um, blown apart the objecthood of architecture, uh, the line between what is a resource and what is, let's say what is passivating, what is being passivated towards, uh, if I can use that language. Um, Forrest, you're here twice. Yes, I'm, I'm here because I feel like we were debating whether we needed a break. But I, I would just point that you can go outside if you have a phone. But this is also to give something very relevant to Dan's talk, which is that we do make buildings that passivate and do all kinds of interesting things. And the Anlinger Center building is one of them. And just for small entertainment value and to go outside, but also to show you that chemistry in buildings is real. Um, this is the concrete of the building. Um, and you can see there's all of the calcium carbonate that our building is naturally releasing as water drains through this stairwell somewhat improperly, which yeah, you can just see a drop fall there. Um, and so again, this is just to show maybe a real life example of the ways in which concrete is in fact alive. So this exact same material that you'll see in stalactites Yikes. form in caves, though it happens much faster in the building when water flows through concrete um, and changes the sort of chemical dynamics of what are happening. So, you know, if you've ever been to a cave, they tell you don't touch them because they'll take thousands of years to grow, but these take about a few months to grow. Um, and that just gives a sense of how concrete is really. We lost forest, classic, but thank you for, okay. So thank you to all our panelists. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Fantastic. Well, we, uh, just a quick, um, sort of because we're, we might suddenly be joined by people expecting the keynote and also to tell our keynote speaker own, we will take um, uh, 15 minutes for, for a good uh, Q&A discussion. I think that's what it takes to at least have a good back and forth. And then um, as we said, because we're rolling and, some, and our keynote speaker is very late in the evening, I think we will go straight to, a, um, to the keynote at 1.20. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to start off the conversation by just noting that it's been very interesting in this panel to hear that beauty has returned. Uh, the word beauty was, you know, uh, David and Felix, um, I, was, I was holding my questions for you because on the one hand, I find that your desire to visualize energy is clearly what's making you both render materials visible again. So you're both redrawing materials and you're both re-representing them as materials, you know, this is wood. This is how it's understood in the in the construction process, or this is a recycled or reused material, and, and they have to be made visible because indeed those materials don't are not often featured as you know um, heroic um, uh, protagonists of architectural culture. So it's already work to visualize objects that you know are, are maybe down the chain. Um, on the other hand, in terms of energy. I did notice a significant stepping away compared to the first panel of the human, you know, the original human motor, the original, you know, person who experiences and exerts energy. And so I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on what pressure you feel to either visualize or not, or talk about or not, because of course your visualizations show us very much that you know exactly what labor it will take to build something, what movements, both the labor in the abstract sense of who will build it, but or how much it will cost, let's say, but also the specific technical gestures that have to be done. So I'm wondering if in your visualizations between material and energy, do you what are the pressures and what are the opportunities for you know the, the human motor, let's say, that is also experiencing energy and producing it and delivering it? And then I'll have a separate question for Dan, uh, not about the human. <laughs> Felix, do you want to go first, or? <laughs> I'm, I, I'll jump in. Um, so, I mean, I think the first part is easy, um, or it's not easy, but easier. Um, the question about beauty, I think, for me, is important. If we talk about sustainability, um, uh, the love for something is probably the most driving, the quickest driving force to make it last longer. So if, if you if you enjoy something, you'd start taking care of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that maybe brings us also to the kind of influence of the human in all of this, right? I mean, we can talk about um, numbers all we want. If if we want to live in a circular economy, then, then that moment where I pick something up and throw it away is, 
or not, right? Is an essential moment in the question, do we close that loop or not? Right? And so bringing it back to that beauty, if, if, I, if I want to take care of it, it is more likely that I treat it in a more circular way. And so I think that is something that we as architects should be talking about, right? I mean, we, we're, we're designers. <laughs> and so bringing the design aspect back into that conversation in terms of you know, prolonging the, the use of material, not necessarily prolonging the use of the service time, but prolonging the use of that material, um, I think is an important aspect. Felix, I, your presentation, it seemed to me, had a kind of secondary point, which actually was extremely strong in that you made a great argument for preserving existing buildings. And the road to that, to me at least, is improving materials and methods that would be used for repair and maintenance. So I would just urge the participants and attendees and so on to take a look at what's going on now as a joint process between the American Concrete Institute and the International Concrete Repair Institute. And that all has been released in the last two years or so, two or three years. And also a, a, a larger project that the Getty Conservation Institute began in 2012 called Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative, which has now focused on among things, among other things, but has focused very much on concrete structures. And the Getty trying to partner with people in the UK and in France who are working on concrete repair as a means to hold on to these buildings rather than demolish and try to recycle materials into new structures. Yeah, that's a great point. I agree. I mean, the, the most sustainable building, if you want to use that term, is the one that's already there, right? Yep. Um, in, in terms of materials, <laughs> not necessarily in many other questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we had a great person from the Getty, right, Lucia, or that was working with on the last conference too, for reference, yeah. But to the beauty question, I guess in Pratt, how do you translate that to practice? Maybe I'll push the envelope a little on the, the pavilion project, David, like the doing exhibitions and pavilions and how much, how much resistance there is also to Lola. And it's really hard to change standards. So this relates to both obstacles in terms of standards, but then obstacles in terms of not building what people are used to things looking like, I guess, how much, um, have you found ways around or address some of those challenges? Yeah, um, I mean, I'll just add that I, th I think the, the idea of drawing the human is, is really important. So that's a great question. Um, and for me, I think um, we've been looking for ways to do things like um, draw the human in the same frame as we're drawing the object and the flows of energy. And so, you know, those material stories as preliminary as they are, are one way to do that. I mean, they, they have the human figure doing the labor at the same time they have the objects moving around, the matter being, you know, transformed. Um, and although this is maybe a loose um, connection, I think also as we've started to try to draw something like the microbial world, you know, this invisible layer that's all around us, it's really challenged us in a, in a good way about how to draw, you know, where's the boundary between the human and the non-human. I mean, everyone knows these statistics, like there are more microbial cells in the human body than, you know, than, than human cells in the human body. So there's already this exchange going on. How do we draw that? How do we draw that interface with the materials, which also have this layer of microbes on top and inside? And, and so I think that's, that's, I guess, where I was trying to go, that like the drawings, rather than be a place where we would, so I almost want to challenge the beauty thing. The drawings are not a place where we would go to like make beautiful drawings or use a drawing to make a beautiful object. The drawings are a place where we can try to understand in a new way what all these exchanges are, what the what's happening with the materials and the energy and the humans and the social dynamics. Can we can we use the drawing to do that rather than make you know some glossy one-off representation? 
Um, it strikes me that what's um, in a way you were sort of drawing what Sophia was describing this morning with the microbial uh, uh, environments. You know, if concrete is going to be understood as ubiquitous, then we might as well consider it an environment for life of all scales. And the and the challenge would be to be able to draw into it human experience that is not exclusively related to the persons who make uh, the concrete or the persons who forget that concrete is there, but to challenge that, okay, if this is the concrete that one habituates to, because materials are so pervasive that they help us habituate to our world. And so what is the proper visualization of that in a way that both challenges the notion of habituation to a material and at the same time invites the kind of pleasure that Lola was talking about. So Lola, pictured the human, she pictured herself um, having an, a material attachment to touching concrete. And that's why she was motivated to make a new, I mean, Dan did something similar, right? Which is that once you see that battery jumping, everybody has that reaction. Okay, what can we do with that battery jumping? It was like, it was such great suspense, Dan. I, I loved it. It was like, okay, so what does it mean that the boundary, battery is bouncing? Are we gonna make it bounce? Are we gonna, you know? Um, so of course the, the resolution is very complicated. I guess what I'm, I'm just wondering if that doesn't in some way question the very idea of lifespan even more, even the idea that we that we think of materials as things that are just things that they are evaluated by the by the standards of even even Felix, what you just said, of course, the the most sustainable building is the one that's already there. But the most sustainable life maybe is the question we should the bigger, slightly bigger question. I do think that it's, it's a valid thing to make those things beautiful, of course, uh, but maybe there's an even bigger um, continuum between human experience and the habituation that that materials do and the blindnesses that they you know imply yeah yeah well david's hilo project challenges the building's already there philosophy a little bit and it's like maybe the, and felix you presented the biological versus the technical cycle i think those are the interplay between whether something exists permanently or is designed to exist very temporarily and we don't really design that way i think i uh, i mean I always have a trouble thinking of something that actually has a closed loop technical cycle. And this is sort of maybe all the way back to Kiel's presentation of like really the externalities of the things in the technical loop. It's really hard to get rid of all of them. I don't know if anybody has a good example. I mean, Lola, I think you're coming close in some of the projects, right? Some of these things are cycling, um, but there's always like, as I was picking on Felix, like there's a crane in the picture. Did you include the crane having to lift the stuff? as part of the cycle that has emissions and it's running on diesel, et cetera, which is always the thorn in the side of the, the picture of the cycle, uh, which I think Kiel does a wonderful job of sort of setting up the problematic of that. <laughs> but I don't want it to hinder the discussion, maybe as a proactive question, what are some ways that we maybe move toward that or you've experienced good aspects? I think the drawing certainly helped to bring in a lot of those other externalities, but maybe there's other examples even with batteries, maybe, I don't know. I think that going back to beauty, there is a really interesting notion of, um, of course, um, uh, sense of aesthetics is individual um, and very similar to you, Forrest, um, as an engineer, uh, <laughs> speaking about aesthetics and design and beauty might exceed my, you know, um, a set of uh, uh, not saying knowledge or skills, but, uh, uh, referring to, for instance, the biophilic design paradigm, which looks at it from an evolutionary bio biology point of view, there are aspects of beauty of interaction with the natural world that we're actually, as human beings, were evolved to uh, interact with in a way that enhances our physical, mental well-being and health. So. Uh, um, I think that's also an interesting aspect of, you know, the interaction with the microbial world and with living spaces mm -hmm. that kind of uh, interacts with our own living uh, experience in a sense, if that, um, right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah. uh, David, as you choose what to draw, I mean, this is basically your five models of research. Were they five? Yes. Mm -hmm. five, five. Drawing is five, right? Yeah, drawing is the fifth. I mean, yeah. that's a loose framework. I, don't, I, I just kind of came up with that for this, but yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I mean, it's really good because it answers a question that Forrest and I are frequently asked and are asking ourselves, which is, okay, so since concrete as an industry is so vast, so massive, and um, in a way, our, 
all of the, these conversations point out what a small role the architect plays <laughs> um, in all this. And thus, but the architect draws, renders visible, and locates humanity in a variety of ways. And so when I see the Stuart Brand diagram of how buildings learn, mm -hmm. which looks like a house, but is really still kind of humanoid, you know, internally consistent with the layers of skin. Um, in a way, I, I want a replacement for that. And I want a diagram that shows us passivation. Like passivation is a concept that until I did this research about reinforced concrete, I didn't understand at all. Uh, it just wasn't something that I understood as a as an option. We continually pass the day to us and down. That's not something you really want to. Um... Your audio kind of dropped out. Yeah, it? yeah. Really something you want to. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah, it just your audio dropped out a little bit. I don't know, maybe something fell on your mic. So, um, it seems to me that passivation, for example, is either something that happens to a, a concrete or it's not. That's not the same. The diagram we need for that is almost like a branching tree. Like so, so you, there are things that you could draw that would not be quite so centered on the material or centered on, you know, like the like the Stuart Brand concentric diagram. Mm -hmm. I think that the question that that leads to there was time scale, I guess, um, of that. I, like where that because you did that David in the, the, trying to bring in time scale into the frame of that the sort of what is the process there's a process but then the process has a time scale and Dan brought this up to you in batteries lifespan is a totally different space but the mechanisms at play are very similar to these very long time scales and concrete and materials that you're depicting and then to Keel's point about the wood cycling I think the biggest problem within the wood, whole wood sector is whether you're looking at like a hundred year cycle of the forest or what we tend to do is take this one little moment where we took the tree down and now the tree's in the building and that carbon now suddenly is negative emissions for some reason, even though with the broad scope of time, what really matters is what's happening in the forest ecology from which the lumber is coming, right? I don't know if time, how much dynamics we really are able to capture in sort of these varying time scales that Dan, I think, started with in his talk too. Of course, I think it's a good way to talk about drawing because I agree that we have to, like as architects, like it's it's the fundamental conundrum of architecture and thermodynamics or ecology is that we we have to draw these things, but we you can't draw energy. You can't draw ecology. Um, you can draw the artifacts or the kind of states of certain things. Um, so I think it's an error to kind of you know, like I'm glad that we're drawing more things, more processes, kind of expanding the system boundary a bit, but we're still drawing them in Cartesian spaces. We're still drawing artifacts, right? Now we're drawing the factory and the tree or something like that, but uh, but we're still thinking through Cartesian means. And I think that sets a real clear upper limit on, you know, we need to learn how to model in Lagrangian terms uh, if we want to really be following things through methodologically in a rigorous way in a scientific and philosophically rigorous sort of way, right? So certain, you know, architects do some things in like Orlarian environments where we simulate a flow of air or something like that. And I think we have some capacities for that, but thinking and practicing in a Lagrangian way is just sort of like outside of any work that I've ever seen in architecture. Um, yeah. But it's absolutely the, the kind of design space that we need to be thinking about and having real conversations about these topics. And it's, it's a super interesting challenge. I mean, it's, it's most of my studios are about some kind of Lagrangian modeling uh, method, um, but, it's, but it's sort of like outside of our vocabulary, it's outside of our imagination. And, uh, but I think it's the key point, like moving beyond a kind of Cartesian or Eulerian design space is at the heart of all of these questions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you showed the the diagrams of Odom, I mean, and worked through that and various various people worked through that. And then David, you had that one diagram of the embodied computation lab with like origin of the tree. And somewhere in between there, I think is a question of engagement in the design process, I guess, to Keel's point about where do we bring time scaling? Can you do a different, a completely different philosophical thinking about presentation and representation um, that really brings those into the, for lack of a better word, the creative process uh, on the design side. So 
Um, there is, I think, another thing of its time that's uh, just we should touch on in the Q and A, which is about space. We haven't really touched on how much all of this changes as you change locations mm -hmm. um, and what's available in terms of how the bringing in climate. You know, the climate itself is changing, right? That's one of the feedback loops we're all acutely aware of. Things are shifting, but also temporally and spatially, we tend right now to build, especially concrete as if it's the same in every place, but moreover, just in general, all the materials, Lola, you've been talking about, they all are much more locally specific. And I think closing some of the cycles has to do with understanding that. I mean, it comes back to the point from the last panel about local materials for concrete. Concrete's still made locally, but it's a global industry. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which those aspects spatially play out and how we think about what comes after, what could, be, do we go to a more locally resourced means and mechanisms, Lola pointing to, or are there ways to close the technical loop and mine our cities as Felix sort of poses, um, or systems that we might employ to better incorporate the design the upfront um, part of the design. So I think there's just plenty. I don't think we're ever gonna come to an answer today, but uh, I'm really enjoying contemplating uh, <laughs> the many different avenues we may. I'm optimistic that we have the avenues, but I'm still challenged as to what is the right direction to take. Yeah, I mean, one way to think about what uh, just happened in this panel is that we just are getting finally closer to depicting material decisions, design decisions that exist both in engineering and in architecture, where people really do ask themselves, what does this, uh, what does this, not what does the brick want to be? what does metal want really what does it you know that moment when dan said that his two mentors were somehow debating what metal wants to be this is essentially a design decision but we are now expanding hopefully enough the 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 seriousness with which we depict that as not just a folly not just an individual folly that is a technically constrained environmentally portentous uh decision but one that is a decision indeed one that has you know, uh, agency and, and, of, and we have to account for those agents. But the more we describe material processes as being subject to those decisions, and the more we then describe how designers act in the world together, I think the better off we are towards, um, you know, having a materially accurate or material in, in informed decision across discipline between, you know, history and theory and, and um, technology. Not to bring it back to us, but that's where we started. I want to add one more. I think that's that's a good way to frame it like what is how does the drawing interface with the point of decision making um one thing i've been struggling with a lot is trying to draw scalability so i don't mean scale and you know in the idea of multiple scales i mean like could we draw the potential for one type of design decision with materials and energy to have like a lever effect um, or to, to be a solution. I mean, it's, it's in a way, I know, there's some, I know there's some potential pitfalls here, but it's like interfacing Al Gore's pie chart of carbon emissions, you know, with certain design decisions. Um, so like, are we really going to make a difference by certain decisions in the right amount of time, speaking of time? Um, or is this too much of a, of a one-off? Um, and that would be the point also where we would have to try to anticipate and even draw unintended consequences. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of thing that comes up with a lot of the systems thinking like, how do you, how do you ensure that by making you know, mass timber as a replacement for concrete, or a better version of mass timber, which might be use bamboo because it can grow quicker. Again, speaking of time, like what what is the scalability of that type of decision? Um, could it could it scale up? Could it have an impact? Could it change the needle in ten years that we need? And would it involve all of these other unintended consequences like? deforestation by accident because of various other forces. So, but, but again, I think I, in, in, in defense of drawing, um, I think just by asking those questions and by having the drawing as a way to like debate them, struggle with them, even fail to represent, 
that's a good way to expand the thinking and the role of the architect and address that urgency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. I think that's so great. Thank rate you. of change. Yeah, thank you, panelists, for um, really in, indulging us and <laughs> and presenting amazing work and presenting together. I think it's also really compelling how it coheres as uh, a new picture of what's going on across across materials uh, through energies.